When physicists started to study string theory, originally in the period from about 1968 to 74, they discovered a lot of amazing and wonderful things. The theory was amazingly rich. It had properties that are quite surprising if one is accustomed to the standard quantum theories. And in some ways, its properties are better. I'd like to illustrate the differences with a little picture. And you should understand this picture as a picture that describes the motion of particles in space and time. Time is going vertically, and space runs horizontally. So for example, this diagonal line and this one describe the motion of particles that come in from the past. Then they go out to the future over here. And in between, there are some processes at space-time events labeled P, Q, R, and S, where the particles branch or rejoin. Either one breaks into two, or two recombine into one. And all the complications of standard quantum theory come from the rules for what kind of branching and rejoining is allowed, and also from the fact that you have to, according to Feynman, allow all possibilities for what P, Q, R, and S were, when those moments were in space-time. And when they happen to coincide, you run into the infinities that correspond to the electron spiraling into the atomic nucleus. Now here's the equivalent picture in string theory. First of all, a point particle has been replaced by a little loop of string. So a line representing the path of a point particle in space has been replaced by a little tube. And unlike lines, which branch or rejoin at definite moments where something happens, the tubes can join in a completely smooth fashion. So while this is a traditional Feynman diagram, this is the equivalent in string theory. Since there are no distinguished moments, P, Q, R, and S, the complications of the many possible theories that come from describing what's allowed to happen at those moments completely disappear. And instead, in the case of the string, once you know what the string is, you also know how it interacts. It interacts by just these smooth processes. In the mathematical jargon, this is a smooth two-manifold, but this one manifold has singularities at definite events where something happens. The infinities go away because they're tied to these definite events, and also, the vast number of choices of conceivable quantum theories disappears because of the same thing. So um, when, for example, Weinberg, Lachau, and Slom invented later on the standard model of particle physics, they in effect gave rules for what happens at P, Q, R, and S. Those rules are rather detailed and complicated. They work experimentally, but it's a long story, and it has to do with selecting one theory rather than another. Whereas for the string theory, when you know what the string is, you automatically know how it interacts. Nella formulazione originale di Gabriele Veneziano, la teoria delle stringhe è in grado di descrivere le proprietà di circa metà delle particelle legate da interazioni forti. Per giungere a incorporare l'altra metà è però necessario compiere un passo ulteriore. Nei primi anni 70, grazie ai lavori di Pierre Ramon, John Schwartz e André Neveu, si fa strada una nuova versione della teoria che prende il nome di teoria delle stringhe supersimmetrica o teoria delle superstringhe. Da questa nuova formulazione emerge un sorprendente fenomeno, la supersimmetria. Alcune particelle sembrano infatti presentarsi in coppia, vale a dire che ad ogni particella conosciuta ne corrisponde un'altra di aspetto sconosciuto ma di comportamento simile. Se risulterà corretta, la supersimmetria diventerà parte fondamentale della nostra comprensione della natura, perché grazie ad essa sarà possibile determinare indirettamente le caratteristiche di alcune particelle, a partire dallo studio delle proprietà fisiche dei loro partner. Le particelle supersimmetriche non sono mai state rilevate sperimentalmente, ma i fisici delle stringhe Sperano che gli esperimenti condotti nei potenti acceleratori del CERN possano un giorno dimostrarne l'esistenza.
Because of what I've just explained, string theories are much scarcer than conventional quantum theories. And if you have something that works, it's very hard to change it so that it still works. And it's very hard for anything to work at all. String theory just barely hangs together consistently, and a lot of surprising discoveries were made in the process of making sure that it did hold together. So, in the early period from 68 to 74, there were perhaps three crucial discoveries that came out of trying to make the theory work and hold it together. First of all, Veneziano had only described half of the particles in the world of strong interactions, and not the half that most viewers of this CD will probably be familiar with. Not the proton and neutron, only the ones familiar in my line of work, like the pion and the rho meson. So, seeking to modify the theory to include all these strongly interacting particles, including the proton and neutron, it was difficult, first of all, and the physicists who did it, including Ramond and Neverne Schwartz, had to invent a new structure that eventually developed into what we now call supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is a new structure in the world of elementary particles. It predicts the existence of new particles in nature that we hope to eventually discover in accelerators. We'll get back to that in more detail later on. And its root had to do with trying to modify string theory to describe all the particles. Then there were two other discoveries made in this early period that, in a sense, caused the theory to go into eclipse, because most physicists at the time thought that these discoveries meant that something was wrong. First, it was found that string theory for its consistency required extra dimensions of space-time. And secondly, it was discovered that for its consistency, string theory needed particles of zero mass, like the electromagnetic wave, or like gravitational waves in Einstein's theory, but unlike the strongly interacting particles, which they were trying to describe with string theory. Just as these discoveries were being made in string theory, something else happened, which caused string theory to go into eclipse for a while. And that was that there was a fundamental new idea about building the strongly interacting particles out of quarks, and what kind of new trick in um, standard quantum theory would make that possible. That new trick was called asymptotic freedom, and it eventually led to the Nobel Prize for Gross, Wilczek, and Pulitzer. So, for two reasons, string theory went into eclipse. First, the progress with more standard theories made string theory seem unnecessary, at least as a theory of strong interactions. And second, the discoveries that had been made, like large extra dimensions and unwanted massless particles, made it seem that string theory was wrong as a discussion or approach to strong interactions. So, the number of physicists working on string theory went down probably from hundreds to practically zero. But the theory did not quite go into eclipse because it had a small number of fans. This is actually the period when I was in graduate school and I wasn't yet conversant enough of things to quite understand what was going on. But the ones who kept it from going completely into eclipse were a small group of fans such as Joel Shark and John Schwartz, Michael Green, Lars Brink, and just a handful of others. And I, they must have been partly motivated by the fact that string theory had proved to be such an incredibly rich thing that hanged together so miraculously that they couldn't believe it had just been a dead end. But there was a more specific thing, which is that, um, okay, the massless particles had come out and nobody wanted them, and dozens of papers had been written by people who didn't want them trying to get rid of them, and it hadn't worked. So, finally, people working on string theory had accepted that it really did predict unwanted massless particles. But Olive, Shirk, Schwartz, and a handful of people had the following brilliant idea. That a quantum theory with these extra massless particles wasn't wanted for the strong interactions, but there is something else in nature, which is an even bigger problem, where it is needed for. And that's the problem of combining Einstein's theory with 
um, quantum mechanics, Einstein's theory of gravity. As I told you before, if physicists grappled through the 20th century with the problem of the electron spiraling into the nucleus, and several versions of the problem were solved, but the gravitational version was not, was not and has not been solved in standard quantum theory, during this period when string theory went into eclipse, a small number of physicists had the vision that maybe it should be reinterpreted as an approach to this other problem of reconciling gravitational theory with quantum mechanics. When they started working on that, it actually had a lot of success. Um, very, very beautiful work was done by Green and Schwartz and Brink, among others, but not very many others, in the late 70s and early 80s. It actually is the period that got me interested in this. By the summer of 1982, I had certainly noticed the work of uh, Green and Schwartz. I remember studying my summer vacation in 1982, studying a review article that John Schwartz had written describing some of this work. They had shown rather convincingly, in my judgment, and it's a judgment that I would not change 28 years later, that even though they didn't understand it well, there was there a consistent theory that overcomes the traditional problems of making a quantum relativistic theory of gravity. And in doing that, supersymmetry was a very important ingredient. Supersymmetry had been invented before just to include protons and neutrons in Veneziano's theory. And then um, Shirk and Olive with the Italian physicist Yahtzee had shown around 1976 that actually string theory generates supersymmetry in space and time, leading potentially to a new angle on the elementary particles. So during this period, string theory was revived with a new application in mind. It didn't yet attract wide interest of physicists, but it was there as a remarkable idea about a very big unsolved problem of reconciling gravitational theory with quantum theory. So by the early 80s, it was pretty clear that there was something big that Green and Schwartz and their friends were doing. It didn't yet have the attention of most physicists, but speaking personally in that period, I just had the feeling that something was going to happen. And there was a question that really bothered me about their work, actually, which is that one of the big discoveries in elementary particle physics had been what we call parity violation. Um, if you look at yourself in a mirror, you look different, but you look like a possible person, as far as you can see. In other words, in everyday life, the mirror image of something is another thing that might have existed in the world, even though it doesn't. As far as we know, in everyday life, it looks like the laws of nature are completely symmetrical between left and right. But physicists had discovered, first in the 50s, and then it was incorporated in the standard model of elementary particle physics in the 60s and 70s. Nature is actually asymmetrical between left and right, and specifically the weak interactions that describe atomic radioactivity have a handedness built in. The neutrino that comes out always spins one way, and the antineutrino always spins backwards. And that's a fundamental asymmetry between left and right. And it looked to me in this period that string theory, at least in the forms that were known, could break the symmetry between left and right, but not in the way that nature does. It's not that string theory was left-right symmetric, but when you try to describe the weak interactions in string theory, they were left-right symmetric. Well, Green and Schwartz made a fundamental breakthrough in 1984, their anomaly cancellation mechanism, which really put string theory on the map for most physicists. They solved this problem of parity violation in the weak interactions, and a whole lot of other things came out besides. So suddenly it became possible to use string theory to make models that not only described gravity and quantum mechanics, but described the elementary particles in a way that got correct most of the highlights, although not all the microscopic fine details. It was a very exciting period in the mid-80s when there were a lot of things that could be done, and the picture um, developed very intensively. <laughs> 